Hey, welcome to Digi Pro Tips. I'm Andy Edmondson, and here we work smarter and not harder. And in this video, we're going to talk about Flickr. Not how to remove Flickr in post production, how to remove Flickr before you even start shooting so that you never have to deal with it in post production again. Sounds good, right? Let's dig in. Frame rates and shutter speed have been a dominant factor in film and TV production for well over a century, since the advent of the medium, really. However, now that we've moved into this new digital age and more people watch online content than film and TV combined, talking about you, Gen Z, then we have a question on our hands. Does frame rate and or shutter speed really matter for digital content? <laughs> rewind, have a brief history lesson into is there such a thing as a normal frame rate? It's worth going back in time briefly just to understand the point at which we currently find ourselves. There are nowadays multiple frame rates used in film, TV, online content, whatever it is, but it didn't always used to be that way. Traditionally, there were only a few that actually really mattered. Now, you might be asking yourself, how does this guy know what he's talking about? Well, Luckily for you, I've worked in feature film, TV and online content, so I have a wealth of experience throughout my career to be able to talk to you today about this topic. Now, the 24 frame per second frame rate, commonly known as the standard video frame rate, is the traditional frame rate and has been since the advent of film and when it was first used in The Jazz Singer in 1927. Before this, there was no such thing as a standard frame rate. And believe it or not, frame rates were anything from around 16 to 30 frames per second and varied all the time because they used to be hand cranked. The film used to go through the camera with somebody rolling it like this. And therefore the nature of a human doing that motion would never be constant. So because you can't get that constant motion, the frame rate varied every single time. But the problem was that all film was projected at 24 frames per second back then. And this 24 frame per second playback, but being recorded in anywhere from 16, you know, upwards via the human element, meant that when it was played back, you had a jerky movement to it. And this was the way things happened until Vitaphone came in and standardized the process. So since then, feature film has predominantly been 24 frames per second for about a century. And just to be exact, it's not really 24 frames per second, it's 23.976, due to how many frames actually go past the camera sensor in a second. And this has become known as the normal frame rate or the cinematic frame rate. Now the 25 frame per second frame rate is the frame rate for all PAL TV broadcasts. And the reason for this frame rate being 25 frames per second is actually to do with electrical grids and the way that TV sets used to display the images over anything else. In most of the world where a PAL signal is received, a television set is normally set to 50 hertz. And that's about the base rate of motion that the human eye can detect. Now 50 hertz is actually the rate at which current is supplied to the electrical grid in countries that receive PAL signals. And it made a good reference for broadcast TV studio cameras to lock onto in the early days of TV. Now the TV sets in people's homes would be supplied with an image that was interlaced. The TV set would then de-interlace that image, therefore making a frame rate of 50 frames per second. Now your eye can only actually see half of that image at any one time, which is why interlacing works. So basically every frame is made up of half the screen in terms of bars. So each bar, every other bar is missing. And then the next frame, those bars are replaced and every other frame that was there is missing again. Because of the human eye and the way it detects motion, you never see that. You just see it as one continuous moving image. And because television sets were set to 50 hertz, that was known as the refresh rate, how often the image was refreshed. Now, just before we move on to the next frame rate, if you're finding what I'm talking about interesting, then do hit that subscribe button, hit that bell notification, so that you know every time that I upload. 
So 30 frames per second by default is known as the normal frame rate for all non-PAL countries, also known as NTSC. This includes countries such as Canada, uh, the US, uh, Japan, and South Korea. Now 30 frames per second is derived from a 60 hertz signal used in those countries. <laughs> Okay, so now on to shutter speed. Shutter speed is used to try and get that natural motion blur that we are accustomed to, something that the natural eye does every day without you even noticing. To capture an image on a camera, the shutter needs to close for the image to be captured. However, if you were to close that shutter every second, then that would create a jerky sort of motion. Therefore, shutter speeds can vary so that you can get a different amount of motion blur and I'll go into this in a little bit later, but definitely when you're in different countries and different lighting, it becomes very important. And with slow-mo as well, then you need to be able to change your shutter speed depending on your conditions. So let's do a little bit of math. If we know that 50 hertz equals a natural motion blur that we are accustomed to and like to view, and we know that there are 50 de-interlaced images being shown every second, then we can calculate that we need to close that shutter 50 times a second to get that smooth motion blur. So we will shoot at 25 frames per second, but the shutter speed will actually be 50 times a second. One over 50 is how I like to shoot at 25. If you're shooting at 30 frames per second, then you'd obviously bump that shutter speed up to one over 60, so that you can get that natural motion blur that we're accustomed to in PAL and NTSC countries. So why does all of this matter in the digital age? Well, we have a lot of control over a lot of elements in shooting. We can change the frame rate, we can change the shutter speed, we can even in post throw anything on the timeline and it will calculate the pull down for you. You don't have to do any of that anymore. But what we don't have control over is the electrical grid and the refresh rate of the lighting. And this is where Flickr gets introduced. It happens before you've even shot and you can't even really see it. And it's all to do with lighting. Now for interior shoots, we have a little bit of an issue being introduced, or at least we have an issue where we're using lighting that uses the refresh rate of the electrical grid that we of the country we are shooting in. So if you try to shoot in a 50 hertz country um, at 30, 60, 120, 240, you're going to find that you've got flicker and pretty bad flicker at that too. See, the camera is capturing 30 frames a second, but the lighting is actually refreshing 50 times a second and so those numbers are not divisible by themselves and that means that at some point you're going to capture a frame that either has uh, the lights on or off even though we can't see it ourselves with the hu naked human eye these lights are refreshing 50 times a second so we need to ensure that our camera settings match that the same sort of thing would happen if you tried to shoot 25 frames per second in a 60 hertz NTSC country. Now matching your frame rate to the country that you are shooting in and the electrical grid that is being used there is easy as long as you remember what I just said. It needs to be divisible by a whole number. So 50 hertz is divisible by 25, so 25 frames per second is a good choice for frame rate. 60 hertz is divisible by 30, so 30 therefore makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Now this may bring up a question. What if I want to shoot 24 frames per second in 50 or 60 hertz countries? Those aren't divisible by 24, so it's not a whole number. What do you do? Well, that's a very good question. And the next thing that we have control over, which I spoke about just a little bit earlier, is the shutter speed. Now you can use the shutter speed to your advantage if you cannot get a frame rate that is natural to the environment that you're shooting in. And the best thing that you can do is to match the shutter speed to the frequency that you are shooting in. So if I wanna shoot 24 frames per second and I'm in a 50 hertz country, then match the shutter speed one over 50 and you should be able to eliminate the possibility of having flicker in your image. What if I want to shoot slow motion is also the next logical question. And that again is quite simple. If you are shooting more frames a second than the lighting is refreshing, you need to change your shutter speed. Basically, I like to double the shutter speed compared to the frame rate so that you are eliminating 
any issues with lighting, but also not having that jerky motion, making sure it's a nice, smooth motion blur. Now, the shutter speeds don't always match double what frame rate that you're trying to shoot at. So if I was trying to shoot at 120, there isn't a 240 uh, shutter speed, so I'd have to go to 250. And the same if you were shooting at 240 frames per second, there isn't a 480, there is only 500. Now everything that I've just said here is to try and eliminate Flickr from being introduced into video before you've even shot it, so that you don't have to worry about it in post. That's working smarter and not harder. And that means that you have more time to be creative. You can finish your edit quicker without having to worry about getting rid of Flickr in post. It's possible, and there's an article on DigiPro Tips about how to do that, but this is where the Pro Tips come in. Now, as I said earlier, it's interior shoots that you're really gonna have a problem with this. If you are ex shooting exterior, uh, you've got daylight that you're using, you're not gonna have a problem. You can go with any frame rate that you like. But if you are interior and you don't have a big budget, you can't buy nice LED light panels, um, then that is the best way to not have the possibility of flicker being in your, in your footage. The other way, and I did just mention it there, is to invest in lighting that does not require you to think about hertz and electrical grids and all that sort of stuff. And you are gonna need some budget for that. And investing in your lighting is probably one of the next best things that you can do to eliminate flicker being recorded. And light systems such as the Kino Flow, um, I'll put a link to these down below, can be used in either 50 hertz or 60 hertz, you can set them to, to either, it doesn't matter. Um, but they're also not susceptible to uh, flicker from electrical grids and frequencies uh, as kind of fluorescence and halogens and that kind of lighting are. Um, tungsten lighting is incredibly susceptible to it. So if you are going to invest, invest in modern lighting. Don't buy secondhand lighting that uses the refresh rate of the electrical grid because you're gonna fall into traps with your shooting frame rates. Um, I'll put links down below to the equipment that I think is the best for modern day lighting and modern day cameras. Now, if you've enjoyed this video, if it's gonna help you in any way to reduce the flicker in your video and you want more tips like this, then you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button, hit the bell notification and you know write a comment as to what you wanna see next. And that means you know every time I'm going to upload so that you can just keep on working smarter and not harder. And that's what we do here at DigiPro Tips and I'll see you in the next video.